welcome to the Always Be Testing podcast. I am super excited to have Graham Hunter with us today. What's up, Graham? Nothing much. Just uh, cranking away. Um, I uh, am at Segment currently and help to run their startup program and uh, really excited to chat with you about learnings and process and everything. Um, you know, we've we've known each other quite a while. I think it's probably been seven years at this point. Yeah, at least. Time flies. Yeah, you were you were I think um you were tradecraft at the time. I was just rolling out Round Barn Labs and mm-hmm. talking a lot about the growth stuff and all the emerging excitement around the topic of growth. We were both in San Francisco at the time. The yeah, pre, pre of COVID. Pre-COVID. Um, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited, so excited to have Graham here today. Um, he is uh, a true uh, growth person. Uh, he, uh, he understands acquisition. He understands multi-channel. He understands teams. Um, he's been you know, featured in a number of interesting uh, speaking engagements and, and pods in the past and leads the startup program segment, like you said. And yeah, man, it's going to be fun. Um, just for the audience out there, tell us a little bit about your background. I I know people would be interested in it. Sure, sure. Um, You know, I started out knowing that I wanted to do startups. And so I just kind of like showed up to Wharton Venture Program and I was like, hey, who needs a guy to do stuff? And, you know, a bunch of social media marketing through like some little agencies and stuff like that. Found a company that I, I loved that was doing e-commerce before direct to consumer was like really popular. Just did whatever was required. I packed boxes for years. And before we got our full sort of like, you know, shipping thing going, learned so much about marketing, so much about e-commerce. And from there, I just sort of like went into agencies or consulting one channel at a time. I started doing Google search, then I moved to SEO, and then I moved to sort of like being a full stack marketer. Um, I joined um, some different startups along the way. I was a director of marketing at Patreon, like employee 38 or something like that. I think now they're somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people. Um, and yeah, so that's really like how I got my start, uh, you know, sort of tackling one channel at a time, educating myself, being able to execute, and then like moving to the next opportunity that sort of like opened things up. And then, you know, after a while, I kept joining larger and larger startups. And then I found Segment because I had used it and it really unlocked a lot of the functionality for all the marketing tools that I used and things like that. And then when I saw that they needed someone to sort of manage the startup program and startup ecosystem stuff, I was like, perfect. This sort of helps me keep my startup background. It's still marketing. I don't know what program management is per se, but you know, I don't think it's that challenging and and so you know really like kept all my skills brought a little more work-life balance from some of my early startup days now that i have kids and things like that and and yeah i couldn't be happier uh love love the team at twilio and segment and um always excited each quarter to sort of like awesome. launch new stuff and uh, that's cool yeah. what what is it about startups that you think kind of uh just like clicked for you I think that the piece where you are the owner of everything in this domain, where it's like, yeah, literally anything that you want to do, as long as it sounds like a good idea, I'm going to say yes to it. You are in charge of like how you spend your time because I don't have time to like hear the details of every, you know, advertising or social idea that you have understand those channels deeply, that's your thing. So you decide, justify, sure, how you 
how you want to be spending your time and the outcome and the timelines and all that stuff. But if you want to do something, do it, you know? And I learned that from sort of like early on, you know, I talked about packing boxes and I was like, we shouldn't be me and the CEO and the CEO packing boxes together. I was like, we should stop doing this guys. We should do other things, you know, like running this company. And so, <laughs> you know, I just outside of my function function, you know, I'm like employee number one. I yeah. basically was like, we need, I need to learn about like 3PO and drop shipping and Magento and its integrations into like, you know, different shipping carriers and how that connects. And so like I did that. And then one day by the time we like implemented all this stuff, it's like we went with, you know, like FBA, uh, FBA fulfillment by Amazon and sort of everything just sort of worked and we never packed a box again. And I was like, this is cool. You know what I mean? People <laughs> giving that. me the opportunities that I feel like I would have to work years to get right away, you know? And yeah, I messed up some big things, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, Good learning and, opportunities. And sort of like lived and learned and, and went from there. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, what, what a great emphasis on learnings, which is, you know, a huge part of the, the theme of the pod of, of testing and learning and kind of taking those learnings and improve upon. So it makes a lot of sense. You obviously had an affinity for what segment was capable of doing. Um, I've always been impressed and um, very um, looked to them on a number of things, um, collaborated with, with you and your company, but maybe maybe tell the, the folks listening about segment and, um, and maybe uh, kind of the easy... Uh, Reader's Digest version, and then we can kind of dive into some of the details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Segment is a CDP, um, and a CDP stands for Customer Data Platform. And basically, the idea is when your data lives in all these various tools and disparate places and um, data warehouses and things like that, doing anything becomes more complicated. You need to be writing some script that's, you know, you need to be writing these SQL queries that are going to query your warehouse and then pull that somehow in, we'll use Airflow and pull that into customer IO so that the traits are that It's like, stop. You know what I mean? Like you need team members, whether they're data engineering, software engineers, marketers, sales operations, to be able to use your company's data to do stuff. And so that means that all of the data sources that you have, whether that's, oh, an opportunity was created in Salesforce, or somebody visited your website and they clicked on this. All of that, all those things are data sources that are pulled into segment. Now Segment's got the full view of what data related to your business exists and then can send all of that data to every downstream destination that requires it. And so to give you an example, you know, email marketing is like one of those things that seems kind of easy and then you get into it and you're just like, I need to integrate this software. What does that mean? Okay, I need to put little, you know, events everywhere on my website so that when someone clicks add to cart, I know that I can, I can send them a cart abandonment email or, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, but that integration process when you're on segment is like, oh, customer IO, great, on. And then it starts sending all of the yeah. data associated with your business to customer IO. And so now when I go in, to build workflows, which is their name for campaigns, you know, things like that, I can say when somebody, you know, like A, D, D, and it's add, add to cart. And I'm like, that's the one, you know, Love and it. then just sort of go Love from it. there. So all of the triggers that, that all these sort of like campaigns use to, to drive all this personalization and like all that stuff, it's just it's just there from day one. And so you're just like, I get it. This is valuable. Like the most expensive things is time and technical people's time. And like this just 
eliminates that. I don't need to talk to engineering as a marketer. And, and you know, it, it also helps with, with other things like data warehousing and all that stuff. That's you awesome. know, just like, yeah, send this into a data warehouse. The end, you know? Super, super um, so, easy. So, yeah, that's segment. That's the sort of like value prop, especially for startups. And of course, as you grow, having your data in one place, manage these like managed data pipelines, you could call them, um, has other benefits, you know, uh, unification of profiles, just having a profile where you can look at a person, oh, this is a contact on an opportunity. They also visited the website. They yeah. also, you know, did X, Y, Z, you know, like that. and you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. The unification of that, once you get into the you know mid market or enterprise space, becomes really easy to like add that functionality on because all the data is in one place, um, yeah. and so it, from there it becomes this really scalable solution where you're like, oh, let's take our data to the next level, click, <laughs> you know, and then it's like, oh, great. Nice. So you, you've seen that's amazing. So just making the complexity of customer data. Um, flows and, and relevancy super easy and, and kind of creating better experiences for users, it sounds like, ultimately. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, it has so many different, like, value props. It's almost like you can do anything with it. Are you a marketer? Are you an engineer? What are you trying to do? Personalization? You know, like, reducing processes internally around data flow? Um, you know, data monitoring? It's like, what happens when somebody somewhere in the company launches a landing page and then fires these events that have a typo in them or that, you know, like red flag, someone's trying to fire an event called added to carp. <laughs> what is added to carp? Um, and things like that from there. So just like there are so depending on who you are, it just like unlocks all of these possibilities manages you know like the data quality and cleanliness all that stuff T tell me a little bit about the segment startup program and how you operate it mm -hmm. so the segment startup program is meant to make segment more affordable for startups we give one or two years of free product on the team plan which is our sort of self-service product um, for companies, as long as they've raised less than $5 million and they're less than two years from founding, that's our early stage program. And um, um, we've seen a lot of folks, you know, use that. I think that something like 50% of YC companies use our program. Um, awesome. We've had over 20,000 startups that have come and, and what? used the program to, to get more awesome. Product. What's the coolest yeah, we all, we, use case? Like, I'm dying to know, like, someone who's, like, integrated segment in a way where you're just like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. This is such a great use case. I'd love to maybe learn a little bit more about um, the types of companies or maybe a, a, an anonymous case where it was like, oh, my gosh, they just, or a non-anonymous case of, like, they nailed it. This is, this is like, the perfect usage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it's it's tough to 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 have a like a perfect use case, but yeah. basically like the more sources and the more destinations you have, the more integrated you are. Like the worst use case is to just add a JavaScript source, which basically is like the website, and then send that data to Google Analytics, and that's it. You know, like that's like why use segment if that's all you're gonna do. That there's no value being created here. Just implement Google Analytics and sort of like be done with the thing, you know? Um, but so if, if every place that data is created, which if you're a startup is primarily web, marketing website, product, and then, you know, any other tools where data is created. So like, you know, I mentioned Salesforce, like an opportunity was created in Salesforce and that's associated to this account. So we want to know that, you know? So if you have all those and then all of the places that need that data, whether it be a warehouse, whether it be um, email marketing, you know, things like that, that's, that's, what a, that's what a good sort of implementation looks like. And, um, you know, I mean, people, you know, can't, from that setup, people can see almost all the benefits that we talked about, except for some of this profile unification stuff, which is like a thing that you can like upgrade into after the program's over. 
Yeah, that's interesting. You've you've seen so many businesses, so many startups. Um, for those that have, let's say, maybe reached a product market fit level, what are some of the things that you see that they're maybe lacking or needing most? Like from your experience, what are some of the things that you've learned and kind of said, I've seen a lot of this and this is what I prescribe for them to help them grow more effectively? Mm -hmm. Post product market fit? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you, we could go both it's ways. Not, yeah. pre -product, yeah. Let's go pre-product uh, let, market let's, fit. Let's go pre because here's the thing is that like, product market fit is not like some sort of like line in the sand where like they cross over and they're like, we found it, everybody. You know, like <laughs> it's more of this sort of like, I think we've got it and let's continue to like validate. And then before long, the customer, you know, profile that you thought was your sort of core audience is like, do we need to expand from that? Do we have mm -hmm. the product? You and then so suddenly you're like, okay, we should be selling not just to data engineers, but also to marketers. Oh, okay, but do we have product market fit with them? Does our feature, you know, like it it's, just gets it's like layered chess. and layered. You're chasing it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So I would say that the biggest thing is that people think that they have product market fit. And that means they should hire, they should like pour money into marketing and they hire a like pretty senior person. And they like, that person is like, we should start advertising. And then they dedicate a big piece of budget for advertising, which really highlights maybe that they are having the right fit, you know? And so, so that is like what I see most of the time is like, we have product market fit. Yeah. That means marketing and marketing means advertising, like boom. And then before they know it, it's like, whoa, these unit economics aren't like really what we expected when you add every little step of the funnel of added to cart and abandonment. I'm going in and out of like B2B SaaS and e-commerce and like some things like this, but you, you get I the love idea. It. I love um, it. That, that's what I see most often. Now, since there's been a bit of a recalibration in the venture market in startup land, that's a whole other topic we could talk mm -hmm. about. Has the percentage of people that are overstating their level of product product market fit gone down? Yeah. Really? For sure. Yeah. People are better at it than ever. People like like I talked to, you know, I talked to a fintech company the other day and like you can just tell the way they talk about it. And you're just like, wow, this, this guy is good. Just customer obsession and focus, like expanding outside of that core persona a little bit to like, see what it's like out there. Um, is that a real fit for their product? And then they find it based on willingness to pay and revenue. They're like, we talked to a comptroller and they were like, this is my biggest problem. And then... We talked to 20 comptrollers and that was all their biggest problem. And then we built the product for that problem. And they're like, take my money, you know, like, and I'm just like, great job. Like, way to go. You know, just like that kind of thing. More and more people are better at that. And if you rewind the startup, eco, if you rewind like all the founders that I like, talk to and work with and all that stuff. All of that information about what it means to be customer focused and what it means to have product market fit was out there and everyone was consuming it. And then it almost felt like they were like not acting accordingly. Like they'd be like, what are you doing for social? We need to do it. I'm like, do we? Um, I don't know. B2B SaaS and social like doesn't always just like go swimmingly, you know, like how many likes did you get on your last? organic LinkedIn post, you know, and sure we should do that eventually. And it, it's just not like this checklist of things that you need to be doing. And, um, yeah. And B2C makes it like much more complicated because of market sizing and, and things like that. Like how many people with this exact problem are there out there? I don't know. And B2B SaaS just makes it like so much easier, so much more playbook E and things like that. Yeah. Say. 
What do you think are the factors that have kind of led? I mean, I talked about kind of that reset that's happened in the last couple of years, but to to maybe um, open up the conversation, like what factors do you think are the reason for the increase in founder IQ yeah. or acumen around growth, if you will? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that like the education piece is just like better and better all the time. You know, well, I see YouTube channel like that didn't exist. Well, I see startup school for folks that aren't in the batches. You've got like Reforge. You've got like just all these things from these people who have really done it and put the work in and thought in to be like, sometimes you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Here are the set of circumstances in which that is true. Sometimes you do need to create something from scratch. Here are the set of, you know, so education is better. Mentorship is better than ever. Um, and then in combination with more sort of uh, diligence for venture funding, it becomes like, oh, they're going to be really analytical and stringent about like, what traction is and what that means and our mindset and like, you know, things like that. I think all yeah. that sort of just like makes people better at, at, yeah. at building companies. I feel like they've also learned the harder lessons and gotten punched in the face a few times over the years in different phases. And I think that's, that's also contributed to it, to your point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so, Maybe you know, the concept of growth and, and startup growth is, is is something that you've seen a ton of. You've helped with it. You've done it yourself. You've counseled and coached people on it. Like kind of similar line of thinking. Like how has that changed? I mean, yeah, maybe there's more information out there. Maybe it's gotten more sophisticated. But like do the types of people that land growth roles, has that changed significantly? Is it the same? Like what are you kind of seeing from the – the startups that you interact with, like what the what's types the... of people that are successful has not changed. And it's basically in my opinion. And I do think that there are more and more people who were in marketing. And then they were like, why would I be in marketing when I can be like in growth, you know? Um, Cause that's hot. And you know, there definitely was a little bit of a, everyone saying they're in growth, even though they're, marketing and to be quite frank like i have always been more of a marketer than a growth person um and you know like i run appreciate like, your honesty and, yeah i run like landing page experiments a b test you know yeah. but i i'm not always in the product doing those a b tests to try and optimize you know like you know at patreon we had paul Ravid, who is pretty much the best growth person I have personally worked with, um, you know, and I think that there are a couple things that make him and people like him successful. One is just this engineer's mindset. Um, and another is like no boundaries, right? Like marketing is advertising plus content plus channels plus whatever, you know, like that, right? And growth is almost like, Growth is the out is the inputs that drive the outcome, you know, and so it knows no bounds. You know what I mean? You don't have any like guardrails telling you that this is included, but that's not. Yeah. And occasionally you step on people's toes, and like that is bound to happen. But take them along for the ride, and they're like, happy to do it, you know. Um, and so, you know, I think that you can read a lot about the. Um, you know, from somebody like Tall about the Patreon onboarding experience. And Adam Fishman's newsletter is a great place to look for, or blog posts with Reforge and things, is a great place to look for that kind of content as well, where they're like, people don't know what this is. Is it Kickstarter, but monthly? Is, was the, like, when I joined Patreon, Kickstarter, but monthly was like the thing, you know, that people at Uber for X, that people would use, they'll sort of like describe the product. And we sort of like realized that like there needed to be this like education piece. Not all creators thought of themselves as business people and didn't like optimize and care about revenue in the same way. And all that got rolled into this big thing. 
and this onboarding experience that everyone went through. And when they came out, it was just like night and day, the outcomes, you know? And um, what, what, yeah, else so, made him, so, what else made him a great growth lead in your mind and like at Patreon? What, what else was kind of part of that besides the engineering mindset? The no I mean, customer mindset. centricity with that engineering mindset, you know, like, um, you know, was he talking to some, customers a lot? I, 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 to be honest, like, I don't know, but I would be surprised if he wasn't, you know, like things like that. Yeah. Um, you also asked a little bit about, uh, like, has it changed over time? Um, and one of the main changes that I've seen is, like early in, and, and maybe this is just a seniority thing or an experience thing, is that brainstorming, prioritization, and execution to me was the like well accepted formula. You know what I mean? For a long time, where it's like, let's talk about the outcomes we want. What do you think an initiative could be that would drive those outcomes? And you're like, this, that, this, that. Okay, let's all get that into a big list input, output probability of outcome you know what i mean where it's like this yeah. is a, a light a light lift with a with a potentially heavy outcome and a low and a high probability of success let's do that you know but i think now there is a little and and that worked because it was easy for everyone to do anyone could get in a room brainstorm prioritize execute and like at some place like Patreon, like that's what we did, you know, like, but now I feel like there's a little more like strategic rigor of like, you can't just do all the things. You can't just sort light lift by the ratio of like inputs to outputs and expect that to like take you to strategic success. There's a little more of like, all right, like maybe this program that takes a year to make, it's a heavy lift. You know, like who knows what the probability of success is? You can look at examples, but like it isn't always one to one. And so I think there's just a little more rigor in the like prioritization and a lot more like storytelling around the initiatives that could lead to these big wins that are outsized versus the like, you know, little experiments that we can run or, you know, things like that. And so storytelling yeah. internally yeah yeah storytelling internally interesting yeah. connecting it to like customer problem statements you know just saying something to the effect of like of like one of the things we've noticed is that creators don't think of themselves as business people like that's a big problem for a company you know like that and so you'd be like what if we solved that problem this way but if you were just like, how do we increase the, um, you know, number of subscribers per creator? Yeah. Or, you know, okay, we need to surface. We need to surface creators to uh, the other people's fans, and you know, it turns out yeah. that, that somebody who joined, you know, um, a crochet channel doesn't want to know about anime. Yeah. You know, and. And, and that cross pollination is challenging and doesn't have that great of an outcome necessarily. And would you summarize it by saying that like the input output kind of pure math problem of of growth that was core to growth maybe in its early stages has evolved to become it's required and it's evolved into a more like nuanced strategic understanding of the customer and the market. For sure. Yeah, I like said that. much better than than anything I could say. No, no I mean it, 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 we're getting there together, man. It's a it's a really interesting, it's a really fascinating concept, and I think you're right. I think the startup ecosystem has matured, the growth ecosystem has matured, the resources and talent has matured. Um, maybe a good segue for people that want to be in growth, or maybe people that want to be in startups. You're a veteran now. Like, what are what are you counseling people on that want to get into it? What are you seeing that works or doesn't work for those individuals? And and kind of, and it seems like maybe it's an easy question because there is so much more than there used to be. But like, what does a new up and comer need to be thinking about if they're looking mm -hmm. into this market and trying to be successful in it? Yeah, 
I think that in the like early stages when you talked to like a Sean Ellis, Gog and Biani, you know, like whatever, those sort of like early thought leaders of like the growth function, you know, Sean Ellis of like growth hacking and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And that's like falling out of fashion, you know. Yeah. But it's all the same stuff. Um, yeah. I think it was like, just start doing it, man. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. just find someone who needs that and like, you know, just do some experiments. And I think that that now there's this sense of you don't need to like, you know, mess up someone's funnel and learn that mistake the hard way. You can learn <laughs> that through education, you know. Um, and so like, you know, these like playbooks, these like assets, these, uh, you know, things, it's like, there are tried and true things. I think, I think it's all about education in the beginning for somebody. It, it uh, I would say one big piece of it is the mindset piece. And so, you know, like you read all these books, like, to understand startups and businesses zero to one or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, good and one. And then there are these like channel specifics where it's like, what are the, it's almost like business case studies, but they're like just famous examples of like conversion rate optimization, advertising, yeah. like how those all fit together. So like learning about the like MarTech ecosystem, you know, all that stuff is required. And I would say mindset, channels, um, and, uh, you know, and then just sort of like putting it all together. Once you have that sort of like conceptual framework using in the beginning, copying what people are doing because they've done it really well. Um, that, that, that's the way to start and not just like find someone who needs this and, you know, like, Offer yeah. your services. You stand know? on the stand um, on the uh, shoulders of the giants. You know, read yeah, your startup sure. and growth history in the form of these case studies to make your life a little easier. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to anyone at, like Reforge, I think that that's that's what they'll tell you. That's the kind of content they're producing. It's just it's like here's examples of what really worked and why it worked. And what situations you should use this playbook or template for, you know? Um, and and then there's also process, right? So when I when I talk about I talked about sorry, mindset channels and and you know all the things that go with that, and then process, like you know process is is a lot of it, and that engineer's mind it lives in this mindset plus process kind of camp, I think. Um, and, um, is, is just sort of like really great. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I have a thought on, we talked a little bit about folks wanting to get into growth. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are on kind of, and I think you touched on it previously, but misnomers in growth, um, what do, what are you kind of running into or what are you kind of seeing as maybe are there are there myths to debunk there or maybe in startups um what are some maybe myths that we can debunk on this conversation i think that acquisition as like a top priority is like pretty tough most people are like, we, oh, we found product market fit. We need to acquire more people, uh, more users, more customers, more ARR, whatever it is, you know? And I think a lot of times that means expanding the pool past this sort of perfect customer type of a thing. I have always been a fan of, um, and it doesn't always work internally organizationally but i've always been a fan of like a qualification metric right so um acquiring a customer that does something you could call it activation or something like that 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 just kind of like a, a very low bar that proves that they're kind of like an okay fit for what this is you know and so a sign up 
isn't that, you know what I mean? A sign up anyone can do when they're like, what is this thing? I'll sign up and find out. And then they bail. Um, it could be like, you know, if I were to, 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 to do, to talk about the segment startup program, you know, like in the beginning, we talked about qualified startups. How many qualified startups are we reaching? Oh, what's qualification? Well, you know, people generally get 100K, 120K when they go through like an incubator or friends and family round or whatever. Let's call that a qualified startup. Somebody who like has money there, you know, like, and so that's just a minimum low bar that we can do. But then when you talk internally about like the number of qualified customers that they're like, what's a qualified customer? Like, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. And so it, it needs the socialization internally to like have everyone be on the same page. And that can be difficult, especially the larger the company gets. Um, I love that. Um, and so, and that qualification can often be tied to that persona that you've defined as like a really good customer. Cause what happens is like you start going outside of that and these core customers are like in a way subsidizing all these other customers that aren't going anywhere. And so suddenly your cost per is going like a little higher and higher and you're like, yeah, diminishing marginal returns, man. That's just the name of the game. And it's all just a math formula to be solved. And then, and then it doesn't really like pan out over time. You know? Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say is like an over focus on hitting these growth numbers, which are yeah. about users. And I'm like, that's, that's a 15 years ago thing. Yeah. Like just yeah. users. Has there been a, has been experience you've had where kind of educating internal stakeholders around, you know, establishing a cohesive quality metric or insulated metric that really helps help support the growth. What are some tricks that you've learned over the years to kind of have those internal conversations that are harder? Like, obviously you have to just have them, but what, what have you kind of, is there anything in that that you've maybe seen from your startups in your program or from colleagues that have, that are, the folks that are struggling to kind of change minds internally around a topic or even exter externally? Maybe you see this yeah. segment. Yeah, I you know, I, I'm I'm glad to tell you like my approach, but this isn't like the right fit for everybody necessarily. So my like in like way that I think about it is quick wins, socialization, and buy-in, right? And so like, you know, I'm like, okay, let me walk you through you're talking to your manager or your manager's manager or whatever in a startup that's probably a CEO, you know, and, and you're like, let me walk you through my philosophy and my process of already. I'm like, if I'm the manager, I'm like, okay, like, what do I need to know about this? Like, what are you going to yeah. do? What are you going to, you know? And so it's too much like the cart before the horse, like theory before execution too much. You're trying to create too much buy-in and, and managers will always give you one way to like run with your idea. And if they don't, they're not great. Um, you know, asking questions and stuff like that. And then they'll, but it's almost like I'm trying to deliver too much. Yeah. Too much buy-in activity before I've done anything. Yeah. And so to me, I'm like internally, Get a when win. I say internally, I mean my team. Yeah. Get a win using your process. Yeah. Right. And then you say, and then you go and you say, let me tell you a little story about, um, you know, about, you know, startups and, you know, let's use the segment startup program as an example, you know, like previously we saw this many startups, but if you actually look at XYZ, that's why we're starting to use this qualified startups metric. And then you know, if you actually look at the number of qualified startups that we've acquired over time, do, 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 that is where the, you know, like real impact is coming from. And that's why we're scaling ARR at the rate that we are quarter over yeah. quarter for the last two quarters or something like that. And they're like, love this. Yeah. And then when you tell them about your philosophy and your process, they're like, can you teach this to other people? Can you be doing yeah. 
but you know like that they're yeah. like okay tell me what it is don't that's lead, working don't lead with the philosophy and process lead with the yeah. hey, impact result test totally and that's just so within a team like you know i have one direct debt segment and me and him are super aligned on process philosophy what we're prioritizing and why sometimes it's because of internal forces caring about you know like new unique logos versus like you know like whatever whatever the priorities of the org are sort of like becoming so we can shift based on that and we are very aligned philosophically we've talked about it you know um and but outside of my team i'm like lead with quick wins and then go and then eventually you've got like a cadence of enough wins that you're like okay here's what we're going to change you know like i use like crawl walk run all the time um and my like i don't know what your what your philosophy behind crawl walk run is um but uh you know or you could say beta you know like yeah pre-beta beta ga whatever you want to you know, do for each thing right um but essentially like when i say crawl up run to my direct they're like okay and i'm like and this quarter i'm thinking we take this initiative from crawl to walk it's like done yes you know and at this point being here four years when i say that to my manager my manager they know what i mean it's pretty understandable uh, you know and we think that the outputs that we have in the crawl stage mean that we should take this to the next level, you know, like that type of a thing. And so like, that's something that when I started, I wouldn't really stay internally. Um, and yeah. now is a part of our process and people know it's a part of our process. I don't need to do as much buyer buy in education internally to like do stuff. I have enough track record that they're like, you want to launch that thing? Great. Knock yourself out, you know? Love um, it. Congrats. Yeah. That's a good feeling. <laughs> yeah, thanks. There's a lot of marketers and growth people out there that, that know of you, who've been students of yours, who's worked with you, who've been clients of yours. What what um what do they not know about you? You've done some pretty cool random things. What are some what are some fun facts <laughs> about Graham? Okay, fun fact. Let's see. Um uh, I've been doing swing dance for about twenty years. Um, and I learned in LA and then I moved to Philadelphia, helped us start the, the Lindy Hop scene in Philadelphia and then sort of traveled the country. I've been to probably like most every major American city, um, for, uh, Lindy Hop and done like teaching competitions and stuff like that. I don't really tell people cause I don't want them like looking up all these old videos of me like just really bad you know really bad dancing i love early it early on but uh you still do yeah it? now uh no i don't yeah which is sad but you know it's just like covid sort of like put a quash to so much dancing and and then having kids you have and twins then, now you know just like yeah yeah twins yeah what is it um, like to have twins that sounds like uh a lot yeah I feel like it's like joining the military. You know, like you talk to a veteran of, and they're like, oh my God, it made me into who I am and it's the greatest thing ever. And I'm sure that I'll feel that way sometime. And as you're going through it, you're like, this is the worst thing that a person could ever experience. And I love them so much. And it's really hard. My approach has been like very process oriented where I'm like, we need to learn everything we can about baby led weaning and napping. And like, we need to like structure a system and talk about roles and responsibilities and like keep each other accountable for it's very like anxiety inducing and like maybe other people do it in a super relaxed way, but like that does not work for us. So like, here we are. Don't have twins. If you can, if you can help, us. but I'll try to really avoid it. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. How, how's life on the farm? Oh, life on the farm is like pretty great. We're at a perfect time right now where we've got raspberries, figs, oh. apples, and blackberries all like coming in simultaneously. You just walk around and you're just like, oh, 
Um, really great. And it's just a good excuse to like get people over there, do some apple picking, you know. Beautiful. I mean, for us, it's like the apples are falling on the ground. Jesus, these freaking apples, you know, like, and everybody else is just like, I've never picked an apple off of a tree and eaten it, you know, from San Francisco. <laughs> but yeah. Well, I may have to come check out the compound at some point. And, oh, you uh, for sure do. Yeah. I, I can't wait yeah. to see it. We have a little apartment. And so like, if we're in between Airbnb, whatever it is, like, we'll, we'll put you up, uh, put you up with the kids in the apartment. I love it. I love it. It's been awesome chatting with you, Graham. You've got a wealth of knowledge, so many great stories, and we could go probably another hour longer easily, but we're super totally. grateful to have you, and uh, it was a pleasure, man. So so fun and so interesting. Appreciate you chatting today. Thanks so much, Ty.